We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon. Uh, and I welcome those of you who are visiting us in person and those who join us virtually. My name is Anna Dupan, uh, and I am a researcher in Russian National Research University, National, uh, High School of Economics. Uh, the topic of our discussion is clash of digital civilization, governments and tech giants. And this topic is particularly interesting for me because uh, over the last seven years, uh, I researched the problems of balanced regulation in digital environment. Uh, Online, uh, part of our discussion uh, will be moderated by David Akpatuma, who is a member of the Board for Friends for Leadership. David, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, today is the fourth day of the IGF, and uh, I visited uh, a lot of sessions, and um, how do you think what's the most popular words during all of these sessions? Balance. Balance of interest, balance of regulation, multi-stakeholder -stake regulation. So everybody talked about it. And uh, one of the main questions for our discussion is, is it possible to create a balanced system of regulation where national interests of uh, governments will be protected, where uh, fundamental human rights of users will be protected, and when business interests of technological companies will be protected. Uh, yesterday, um, uh, Vincent um, Cerf, one of the founders of Internet, said very interesting thought. Uh, he said that uh, in modern world, the Internet is the same global resource, the same ecosystem as the atmosphere of the, or the world's oceans. Uh, of course, we can't establish at the level of one country uh, their rules uh, which um, how to protect or how to use atmospheric air or how to use world's ocean. This requires the efforts of all countries. In the past, the establishment of rules for, for regulation of air was ridiculous <laughs> and even stupid. But now, no one doubts that it's necessary. We have a lot of international treaties concerning the regulation of atmosphere and world's ocean, and we have a lot of national legal acts, which also based on these conventions and regulated atmosphere and uh, world's oceans. Uh, the same story is with the internet now. Uh, since the IT giants uh, have a major influence uh, on the use of internet, it's time to define their rights and responsibilities um, towards users and national governments. Now we have less than one hour to discuss these problems, and I'd kindly ask to all of our panelists to uh, meet their presentation within five minutes uh, or six. And I suggest we'll ask all the questions after the presentations of all our panelists. I'll present every panelist before its presentation, and our first uh, panelist, um, who I hope will open our discussion, will be Patrick Penix. Uh, Mr. Patrick is the head of the Information Society Department of the Council of Europe, and he deals with freedom of uh, expression, protection of journalists, data protection, and internet governance itself. Uh, that's why, uh, Mr. Penix, um, I have the following question for you. How to find the right balance between the respective roles of states on light platforms and media stakeholders, as well as individuals themselves, without imposing drastic changes in regulatory and liability frameworks? Mr. Patrick? Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I never thought I was going to be introduced with the sound of the Game of Thrones. 
um, especially not in speaking about the clash of civilizations. Maybe it's the clash of thrones that we have to look into. Um, a week ago, the Council of Europe adopted um, a framework, a framework for the management of artificial intelligence. And some of us will say, to which extent would we not have needed a similar legal framework when the internet came about? Not in order to stifle it, but to enhance it, uh, to ensure that on the one side you have enhancement of progress and innovation, but also to underline that certain applications of the internet potentially pose risks to human rights, democracy and the rule of law. And we're in some ways uh, backtracking now. I think um, it's, we need to be open uh, to discuss those items openly and freely, because there's a number of elements that we need to regulate. I think we need to be able to regulate the prevention of unlawful harm. We need to be able to regulate equal treatment and non-discrimination. We need to be able to regulate data governance for AI systems, ensure robustness, safety, security, cybersecurity, transparency, explainability, auditability, accountability through the life cycles of AI systems, but also in the life cycle of the internet. We find that such an instrument uh, should include uh, provisions on access to effective remedy as well, and a mandatory right to human review. We recommend that this issue be sustainable uh, in relation to all AI systems that should be considered. The Council of Europe has always had a very strong connection with civil society on the one side, but also has had a strong connection with business. And in doing so, we strive for a balancing act. Council of Europe, together with uh, in the framework of the IGF, but also in the framework of the European uh, Cooperation on Internet Governance, and in its standard setting approach, has always prone a uh, close cooperation with civil society um, in what we call this multi-stakeholder process, which is so important also to the IGF. Um, the presence of digital platforms over the past decades, obviously, has taken an incredibly fast uh, and whole new dimension. At the Council of Europe, we look particularly at the impact of the platforms and the internet intermediaries on human rights, the rule of law and democracy. In order to be able to, as you say, balance the acts, we have to make responsibilities clear. We should not be able to give too much responsibilities to private stakeholders, which some governments tend to do, think about hate speech, or not too little responsibility when they are taking over some editorial functions, some curational functions, then we need to be able to frame that. And I think that is the balancing act that we need to be doing. In this sense, digital platforms, they have become an important part of our everyday uh, information and communication activities. They have also transformed our media and news consumption habits. They offer new opportunities in terms of access to information, freedom of expression, public debate and participation. They have become gradually almost indispensable for all sorts of activities, commercial, cultural, social. And at least for this, the two years during the pandemics brought this aspect even more to the front. So platforms are not only become powerful intermediaries between content producers and their audiences, but have also assumed a central position in the world economy, while the whole public sphere has gone through a tremendous structural transformation. New powerful actors, internet intermediaries, have become in a position of prominence and political importance. So those platforms pose new challenges. They give us opportunities, first of all, 
but they also pose new challenges, not only for the realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of expression and information, the right to private life and the protection of personal data, but also for the functioning of our democratic societies. We've seen that. Uh, if you see that around in 70 countries, we've had in election interference, that basically means that we have to make sure that all of this is protected. So the rise of, of digital technologies and the fast growing use of, of artificial intelligence systems, because that's one of the developments, I would say, that since the creation of the Internet Governance Forum, uh, we have, as Council of Europe, embarked far more into a broader area of digital development and its impact on human rights. And of course, the latest exponent, even though this has been present for some time, is the whole use of artificial intelligence. And we've seen that uh, in front of such immense challenges that the health crisis has exacerbated misinformation, hate speech, polarization of public opinion have never been so widespread and are hindering the necessity, necessary debates um, discrimination, reinforcement of already existing equal inequalities, so where is the balance there, bias in treatment, permanent and generalized surveillance, manipulation of individuals, electoral interference, are just some of the content risks related to the application of AI in general, but specifically also through the internet. So justifying a reaction, including through regulation, co-regulation and self-regulation from state and non-state actors. I will stay there for the beginning and then we can uh, open up the debate afterwards. Thank you very much, Mr. Patrick. Uh, so you also said the thought we've already he heard from the member of European Parliament that to the question regulate or not to regulate, the answer of Europe is regulate, but uh, we need to find uh, topics which, is, which should be regulated. So uh, now we know about the European situation and uh, uh, I'd like to give the words uh, to Mrs. Yombonana Andrea Mampionana, who can uh, tell us about the situation in, the, in Africa. Ms. Yombonana is a telecommunication engineer and a girl guide leader also. Uh, that's why uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is the context of digital transformation in Africa? What are legal frameworks of digital rights and internet regulation in this region? Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for giving me the floor. Um, yes, I would like to extend our debate to another part region of the world. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated digital transformation around the world. Global coverage continues to grow. The last GSMA's report highlights that even Sub-Saharan Africa, which was the region with the uh, largest coverage gap, is actually now at 81% covered. Sure, after comes the concerns of unsaid, the affordability, the resiliency of internet, but we can say that global coverage has increased consequently the last year. So um, the subsequent medication measures put in place by governments uh, during lockdown period, including the stay at home instructions, have changed a lot the use of internet. Internet has become um, a critical enabler of social and economic change and offering new ways of addressing development challenges. Those who are online tend to enjoy a richer experience of internet by engaging a wider range of activities. The rise in local startups, multinational companies was expected to be a lever for development in the South and bringing with them new employment and uh, increasing state resources, of course, they are engaged in both social impact and uh, improved infrastructure. To provide a, a legal environment conducive to the creation of local or foreign businesses becomes a priority in the South. So it has been more accelerated following the outbreak of COVID. We are then witnessing the adoption of legal data protection framework. However, actually, 
only 33 out of uh, 54 African countries have enacted data protection laws. The others does not um, uh, have drafted regulation, but they have not passed yet. So in addition to that, the countries have adopted various legislative frameworks and obligation that govern the way that content is regulated. Despite these efforts, we should have been improved the public-private partnership, as well as the daily life of all citizens. There is a regressive online content regulation and taxation. Startups working remotely or a trade are assumed to be illegal as they do not participate or not enough participate in consolidation of state fund and tech giants are struggling with license fees. That is the situation. A lot of, con lot of African countries have recently still experienced internet or social media shutdowns. And this, uh, this uh, disruptions have been ordered mostly by the governments. And even outside Africa, it still happened. They were related to elections, protests against government policies. Government, government cite digital technology is increasing usage to spread disinformation, propagate hate speech, and public disorder, undermine national security. The use of this practice means that the regulation fails and the government is trying to regulate by themselves, by themselves harmfully internet. Internet shutdowns not only have impact on digital rights and even human rights, but it has corrosive effects on economy. Um, should, governments should prioritize all no shutdown and no arrest options when seeking best practices to resolve regulatory issues. Dialogue between the states and non-states, multi-stakeholders could provide solutions based on improved internet governance, either for the regulation or the taxation. While criminal sanctions can be an effective way to counter hate speech, it is necessary to find an appropriate balance between censoring content and respecting freedom of expression. Um, I will leave it for now, but uh, we will continue, so David. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonana. As we can see, the processes which uh, are going is the same over the world. And uh, with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our next panelist. Um, he is here in person. It's Mr. Lucien Castem. Mr. Lucien is representative for public policy of AFNIC. It's France's top-level domain manager and also researcher at Sorbonne University. Uh, Mr. Lucien, what's the situation with content regulation and uh, regulation of digital platforms in uh, France and uh, how it's planned to provide transparency of digital platforms in the Europe? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor. That's quite uh, an interesting question indeed. Um, and <laughs> indeed, it was quite great uh, to have the introduction from Patrick to, to set the scene. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has clearly accelerated uh, the digital transformation of the world. And it's making visible key challenges such as uh, digital transformation, for example, of SMEs, and new policies on digitalization, both society and transformation of businesses are uh, in the making. And clearly, there is also a need to consider digital inc inclusion by design. Um, internet has an incredible potential, but also uh, pose uh, a number of risks for human rights. Uh, and one of the, 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 the examples which is quite interesting uh, is the balance between content regulation and obviously freedom of, of speech. You need to have an effective uh, remedy to unlawful arms. But I uh, wanted to present you two initiatives that we, we, we led in, in France quickly uh, to, 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 you know, to, to nourish the discussion on first uh, fake news uh, regulation and uh, secondly on, on hate speech. So first of all, uh, there is a problem clearly of uh, definition. 
uh, regulating this information has a lot of implications for speech, but also for privacy. And in, in the European Union, the ongoing dynamic in regulating this information is, as the chair said, focusing on the balance between rights, between freedom of expression on the one hand and cybersecurity and the resilience of society on the other hand. Uh, for the French use case, I'll, uh, I'll uh, go back to a law which passed in 2018 with the aim, which is called the law on, uh, on in French, is lutte contre la manipulation de l'information. Basically, it's a law on the fight against information disorders. Um, that law had the aim, basically, to tackle disinformation online and better protect democracy against hybrid threats. Uh, it was in enacted in December 2018. It, it creates a range of new duties for online platforms, um, including an obligation to cooperate with the regulator, the French regulator, and to develop an easily accessible and visible reporting system, as well as implementing a number of complementary measures, some of which me were mentioned by Patrick, for example, auditability, and transparency of algorithms. Um, so basically, the idea is to target the rapid spread of fake news online and have a particular attention. And you know, um, in France, we have a presidential election coming in 2022, in a few months. So it's quite a, a key topic uh, in an election campaign, either just before an election or obviously during an election. So uh, in a nutshell, the law creates a legal injunction allowing an interim judge to qualify the fake news uh, legally and then order its removal under a uh, um, strict legal regime. The fake news must be manifest, disseminated deliberately, and compromise, obviously, the outcome of an election. Another interesting point I mentioned quickly is promoting transparency obligation for digital platforms and a duty of cooperation for such platform. Uh, the compliance uh, with the duty has been entrusted in 2018 to the French audiovisual regulator, Conseil Supérieur de l'audiovisuel in, in, in French, and uh, the authority has gained new power to do so. Um, uh, a, key, a, key, a key point um, following uh, remarks on the multi-stakeholder way is that um, the regulator at the time has put together a project team which is becoming a direction uh, with the growing duties of the regulator and also an expert committee in a multi-stakeholder way composed of 18 experts from different backgrounds to be able to understand the phenomena and to tackle it. So back to, um, back to the content uh, regulation dynamic, uh, obviously the thematic of the freedom of speech and content moderation on the broader scale uh, is still uh, ongoing. We, we had a number of legislation, but I, I see the time <laughs> going. Um, and you have also a trend of legislations at the European level, including the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, the AI Act, and so on. And um, most of, of these are being discussed as we speak. Uh, the consult position for the DSA are being validated last week. And um, in, in the last months, we had two other major laws enacted in, in 2021. One in August uh, this year, um, on the principle of the Republic, uh, adding new provision on, on, on these topics. And uh, another one on October 25, uh, this year also, uh, sanctioning the protection of IP in France and also the regulators, the, the CSR, uh, as well. So uh, to conclude, Clearly, uh, there is a need of, of balance, not too much responsibility, but not too little, uh, to quote my colleague. And that's a key point because it's encompassing all stakeholders to build a long-term vision of the development of the internet with the aim of a safe and stable internet. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Lucien, for sharing your position with us. Uh, and uh, now uh, we want to know the situation on another group of in another group of countries. Uh, I speak about the Latin American and Caribbean group, and with great pleasure introduce our another panelist, Mr. Roberto Zambrana, uh, who is an electronics and telecommunications engineer and has vast practical experience experience in the complex questions of regulation. So. Can you share with us uh, your position? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with this great panel. Yes, in our region, in in, uh, in Grulac, in Latin America, there are uh, certain experiences regarding all the different um, aspects of regulation that we had to face. In my case, I was working for the last 10 years uh, at the City Hall in La Paz, Bolivia in charge of the e-government um, era. And uh, we had a chance to actually um, provide a draft for, for a law in order to regulate what some people used to call transport uh, services. Uh, of course, this kind of uh, applications, digital applications, uh, are in the transport in public transport area, but uh, those are not responsible for the transport itself. We all know which kind of companies we're talking about. And um, what we did at the beginning was to um, analyze what we had as uh, as the terms of use of this of this particular com company as as uh, as an initial study case. So uh, one of the things that we noticed, because uh, as you may think, these terms of use are really long documents with different st the stuff um, with several several pages. One of the things that we noticed is that uh, in order to use these kind of platforms, the users had to resign all their information, the personal information. And it's not something that usually the people is aware of. Um, the other interesting aspect is that in case of conflicts, we needed to go to the places where these companies are based. That's another problem as in terms of jur jurisdiction. And uh, well, of course, when we started to, wrote, to, to write the law, we decided to uh, ask them to change these kind of things because, uh, of course, um, there are basic, basic aspects that we need to have control in terms of regulation. One of those is, of course, the um, jurisdiction. The others uh, are related with uh, personal information. And uh, I am mentioning this as an example because uh, usually in most of the, of the terms of use of these digital platforms, we have to face with this kind of reality. And uh, we can also... Uh, see and uh, we can also have the evidence of, uh, about this regarding how different these terms of use are from one region to another or from one country to another. Um, we will all like that this kind of uh, terms of use based um, with approach of human rights, for instance, will be the same for all the regions. It doesn't have to be different in one to another. And one of the reasons for this, I will say, it's uh, in, in our case in Latin America, and uh, we see this as a great example regarding, regarding Europe, the European Union, because in Europe, you, you have a way to provide a regional regulatory framework, and that's not the case in our region. In our region, actually, we feel that we are really warm. Actually, we're calid we, between each other. But the problem is that each country has its, uh, its, its particular agenda. And uh, in regulatory area, it's not different. And that's a problem. That's something that we, as, as region, we need to learn from some other regions, such as Europe, in order to come up with a very strong regulatory framework. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to face this kind of, um, of problems with the, what we call these giants. Um, I would like to put another example. I was talking about uh, public service, and, and the other example that I want to, to, to talk about is regarding to uh, entertainment. Uh, again, and after the pandemic or during the pandemic, 
entertainment companies, again, grow a lot, uh, and which is good, of course. Uh, the problem is that in some cases, they were affecting local markets. I would like to mention, in, in our case in Bolivia, uh, the TV cable companies. Most of them are, uh, most of these companies are actually the companies providing telephony systems, telephony service, I mean. And um, one of the, their core business is where, was uh, TV and cable services. And when these entertainment uh, companies, uh, uh, we're talking about, of course, as platforms, as digital platforms, when they came to, came to, to Bolivia to be one interesting and very cheap alternative for, for users, of course, nobody wanted to continue paying for the TV cable service. So that's another uh, interesting uh, aspect to analyze because, yes, these kind of services in some cases are really disrupting for our local economies. And, and uh, in, in most of them, they don't even pay taxes, the local taxes, claiming that, um, claiming that uh, they can pay twice because they already are paying taxes in the cities or countries where they are based. So that's another problem that we need to face. And we need to start talking about taxes. I know even being uh, Serov, which is a very dear person that I, I, I really, really appreciate. And of course, we all uh, recognize him with all the great job that I have done. Even he has a little bit of problem talking about taxation when we talk about when you talk about uh, applying this kind of taxes to digital platforms. I know his point of view, but, I, but, but again, it's something that we need to start talking about. It's really important about it. Um, well, I think I can stay here. I think I covered two interesting examples of what we need to face when we are dealing with these giant companies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta. Uh, I remember that uh, during our last session about emerging regulation, um, um, Vincent uh, Surf said that we need regulation. He also said about it, of course, he said about self-regulation and other methods, but he emphasized that it's necessary to regulate some aspects of uh, uh, international um, attitudes. And um, uh, also, you have very good idea that uh, uh, when uh, countries have the same regulation, it's very good for them. They have common legal framework and the uh, experience of Europe um, emphasized it. Uh, that's why uh, we also uh, need to uh, look at uh, its experience. And um, our session called uh, Clash of Digital Civilization, Governments and Tech Giants, but of course in the relationship um, uh, there are three parts. Of course, we also need to hear the voice of uh, users, so the use of civil society. And that's why our um, uh, next uh, panelist will be Miss Marie Lu Kunana. She is virtually with us. Uh, Miss Kunana is a writer at Philippine Daily Mirror, its online newspaper. And she is also founder of Soamona, a global platform promoting Philippine culture to the world. So um, I hope Miss Marie Lu provides us the user's feedback um, for this problem. Marie Lu? Good day, everyone. My name is Mary Lukunanan from Suyamano, and I'm here to share with you about our learning platform that was created during the COVID-19 pandemic and some lessons that we've learned about fostering digital innovation. In 2019, about 8.2 million visitors came to Philippines because of business, uh, uh, tourism, and the warmth of our people. Philippine tourism was clearly uh, on a roll. However, this momentum was cut abruptly by the COVID-19 pandemic. Those who wanted to visit the Philippines and experience our culture were locked out of our borders. Out of this massive gap, Suyumano was born. Suyumano is a Filipino virtual platform focused on cultural learning experiences, uh, touching from local languages, Philippine mythology, cultures, med medicine, and so on. We provide assistance to displace hospitality, teachers, tourism workers on how to pivot digitally and how to market their crafts and skills globally 
and help them to become part of our platform so they could continue to, prom to promote Filipino culture under the new quote unquote normal. We expect Sayumana to grow even further in the coming years, but so far, let me share with you the biggest lesson we have learned as we grew our platform. Multi-stakeholder cooperation is very crucial. Sayumano, which is a private endeavor that started out as a passion project, would not be here where it is today if not for our partnerships with different entities from the government, from the private sector and civil society. We partnered with Philippine Airlines to create cultural packages specifically catered to those quarantined after returning to the Philippines from overseas. Many independent cultural workers, educators, and advocates of Filipino culture are sharing their expertise via our platform. We are also currently collaborating with Philippines Department of Tourism and Tourism Promotions Board in promoting local tourism to international community and engaging cultural workers to go virtual. All of these, of course, while complying uh, with lo digital local regulations such as the Data Privacy Acts of the Philippines. As Suyamano, uh, as well as other emerging digital platform continue to evolve and innovate to share the beauty of the Filipino culture. We're looking forward to partnering with government bodies private businesses and advocacy groups al alike to help accelerate one of the paces of, accelerate the paces of digital innovation in the Philippines. So we're very happy that we have those partnerships with the government, uh, cultural workers, uh, private sectors such as airlines in order for us to move forward and help together in this digital world. I look forward to whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Mary Lou. And now we are starting the period of questions and answers. So if you have uh, questions and you are here in person, so you can go to the microphone and ask your question. And uh, uh, our organizer, uh, Mr. Roman, will help me with uh, online questions from our chat. Um, that's why uh, our first question will be from Online? Thank you. Thank you, dear Anna, dear colleagues, dear participants. Uh, thank you very much for your interest uh, in our uh, topic. And uh, it would be fair to uh, first raise the question slash comment uh, from the chat, uh, which was my question. I think that the crime is crime, whether it happens in physical world or in digital space. We really need law and regulation to ensure social order public health and users' rights in both cases, in both spaces, to whom we could call immediately at global level, especially when internet-enabled crimes like ransomware or online child pornography happened on the internet, including on the cross-border social platforms. Could good and proper laws and regulations at national and international uh, uh, are ne necessity to have a safe, secure, healthy that is free from harms and crimes for all. It's quite an interesting rather common than question. I want to share with you very briefly uh, my personal experience of uh, IGF engagement uh, since I think 2016 or 17 uh, in Geneva. And the next year I was uh, elected to the MAC, which I'm outgoing MAC member right now. And uh, at that time, when I raised the hand in the session for newcomers, I think Vin Surf, who you already mentioned, was there. When I said the word regulation, the whole room was looking like, what? So, and now you see the forum, almost all the discussions are about this necessity because the pandemic really showed us that we drastically need to understand the rules of the game and widely share the responsibilities, the rights, and to ensure that all stakeholder groups are in a perfect balance and that all interests are taken into consideration. This is uh, my some reaction and comment on our online um, comment. And uh, one of my friends uh, told me that uh, our main uh, task is to ensure that the pandemic will not happen online. Because if we don't take the necessary precautions 
and measures, including this rules of the game or what the uh, Honorable Secretary General of the United Nations recently proposed in his uh, our common agenda, the Global Digital Compact. I believe that we need to proceed in that direction, and I'm happy that the United Nations is moving in this direction. Thank you. Okay. And um, do you have any questions? Kindly mute the uh, audio off. Thank you. If there is no question offline, maybe you can. Uh, you have question in online or auditorium. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, yes, you can ask your question. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Mr. Woman and dear uh, Mrs. Moderator. Uh, I would like to mention that I had one question. In the situation of a cyber crime, to whom we could call immediately at the global level, especially when internet enabled crimes like ransomware and online child pornography happen on internet, including on the cross border social platform? Uh, that was my question. But uh, I would like to mention to uh, another important issue here. Uh, if it's possible, I can uh, uh, talk about here. One but minute, please. Yeah. Please keep it short. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I have learned uh, from uh, Madam Moderator, uh, Mr. Windsor said that Internet is like a world ocean. If we accept this notion, then we should accept that at, at last, at least a uh, public core of internet is for all humankind, like outer space. Uh, it could be uh, uh, common uh, heritage of uh, mankind, humankind. Then all nations should have share and role in internet governance and management mechanisms. But right now, I can an internet public core run only under US jurisdiction. Don't you think that like outer space, that the world has uh, an uh, experience of the community of peaceful users of outer space, COCOS? We need an international legal framework. I mean, something like COCOS for use of cyberspace. As yes, a thank you ocean. very much for as your idea. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. It's a great idea, and I also have the same position. And uh, I, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Patrick Pennings to answer this question, if it's possible. Patrick? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, it is indeed possible to answer the question. Um, in the Information Society Department, we happen to have uh, one convention, which even though it's not global, it was uh, started by the Council of Europe some 20 years ago, it's actually celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, which is a cyber crime convention. And that tackles exactly what Amir is referring to. Um, it has been ratified by 60 state, 66 state parties right now, all over the world. Not every country adheres to it, but we have around um, cooperation activities with around 130 countries around the, around the world. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, it was supplemented by an additional protocol. And that additional protocol refers to access to evidence in the cloud when it comes to uh, cyber offenses. Um, and it was already supplemented by a first additional protocol uh, which concerned racism and intolerance and xenophobia. So there are tools out there, and these are practical tools because it is law enforcement that cooperates together, uh, police, um, prosecutors, judges at a global level that cooperate in order to combat cybercrime. That's not enough, that is clear as well, but that is definitely an important starting point, and we hope this uh, second additional protocol on cloud evidence uh, will be ratified, well, will be open for signature in May next year. And we hope that it will be followed by ratifications by the countries uh, of all continents. 
Thank you very much. And we have the question from the our audience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Professor Avinash. Uh, I'm from India, and I do. I'm a professor of law actually, and I'm you know interested uh, by your regulation that you in introduced in 2017. I think that was the right time. Uh, I do my research on law and regulation of AI and emerging technologies, and uh, my specialization earlier was international law. So my question to this forum is that in last 75 years, what we have observed that we have created so many rules, regulations, soft laws, horizontal laws, sectorial laws, subject specific laws at the global level, but enforcement was an issue. Yeah. yeah, enforcement was a very serious issue, even in the human rights, humanitarian law, or even the WTO, you have seen the, it was very difficult to enforce the judgments of WTO tribunal against the big uh, countries. So having said that, my question is that when we talk about the virtual world where the countries even doesn't have much control because the stakeholders, they have their independent uh, presence within the country and outside of the country. So the question is that what type of rules and regulations we are expecting at the UN level? Are we looking for even again the soft laws or some guidelines or some horizontal so that's my first question. And second one, two big players are absent in this debate right now, the US and China. The two countries, uh, they are having the most advanced technology in terms of AI, cyber, and all these things. So unfortunately, they are not participating much at the global level. So in their absence, if any law is made, so would it be possible for the enforcement? Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. And uh, whom do you want to answer your questions? Uh, uh, anyone, anyone. Uh, I think anyone like I use. Uh, Lucien, can you help us to answer the question? Ah, Roberto, Roberto one. Ah, okay. Then you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'll just be uh, quick. Uh, examples uh, led by Patrick were quite interesting. Indeed, having international instruments uh, is the first step. The Cybercrime Convention is quite interesting in this regard as well as on uh, protection of personal data, con Convention 108. Um, at the European level, uh, just to, to give an example, the, the, the idea between the legislative package, DSA, DMA, as well as on other acts, such as the GDPR or the Data Act, uh, is as well to try to um, pave the way to enforceability and setting a scene of um, let's say, balance regulation, uh, having actors collaborate uh, in that sense. Thank you very much. And Roberta, can you add something to the words of Lucien? Yep, thank you. And a very quick. Uh, and also, I wanted to mention this uh, general uh, regulation about data protection, because uh, without the need to force to the globe uh, at a global level, because this is a regulation for European Union, without that need, uh, um, as a matter of com competitiveness, it had to be followed by all the world. And I want to put just the example in my country. If one local company of transportation, air transportation, wants to transport a, Euro a European uh, a member, uh, have to follow this kind of regulation. So in a way, that's another form of um, comply to or reinforce this kind of regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roberta. Yes, the problem of enforcement, uh, it's the crucial one, I think. And uh, that's why uh, almost everyone think about the uh, international treaty, because it, in this case, it will be possible to reflect the provisions of the treaty in the national legislation and then uh, provide uh, the enforcement. Like in another sphere, uh, we have uh, international law and international practice, uh, how to enforce uh, the international treaties. Uh, maybe someone else wants to answer, ask the question. Maybe from our um, online auditorium. Is there anyone who wants to ask the question from online auditorium? Uh, well, uh, we still maybe have 
10 minutes and uh, I just understand that while we are coming from Russia we didn't share our uh, own uh, position from this uh, like Eurasian space maybe I can briefly comment on this uh, I think that would be a bit <laughs> valuable and uh, there is a recent uh, piece of legislation like local act I don't know how correctly to translate it uh, but you can uh, use very uh, illustrative infographics from our website of organizers of this session cgitc.ru Center for Global IT Cooperation and you can come and visit our booth offline or online of course and uh, you can see uh, how Russia is trying to actually uh, make this dialogue between global IT uh, platforms and uh, just to make it re regulated but in the favor of all sides. So kindly uh, have a look and plus we also recently have issued a comparative uh, analysis of uh, digital platforms regulation uh, from different countries. It's also quite interesting uh, because um, you see how actually very commonly many countries are now considering uh, this necessity to regulate. So I really do think that the answer of this question in there is uh, yes, to regulate or not. But again, uh, I believe that we can all do it in harmony and that all stakeholder groups can be eventually happy when uh, users are happy, businesses are making profits, governments are happy because their citizens are yes. safe and sound, and uh, young people also should be happy and see the uh, global perspectives for their talents realization. And when I, um, uh, I heard the uh, speech of Lucien, I also think about the possibility to uh, provide transparency. Uh, we, um, when we looked at uh, projects of uh, DS DCA and DMA Act, uh, uh, of course, they are very interesting, uh, they are huge, <laughs> and uh, they, um, they have a lot of provisions uh, how to provide uh, the transparency. Um, maybe you can give us some examples of uh, these provisions, how to provide transparency of algorithm and so on. Uh, well, in uh Let's say six minutes would be... Yes, <laughs> we, ha we have uh, two that's minutes. <laughs> that's challenging. <laughs> I'll, I'd say that's quick. Um, indeed, you have a lot of uh, instruments being negotiated with uh, transversal thematic instruments like the artificial intelligence uh, proposed regulation. Um, but also, uh, as you said, backbone um, of the EU internet regulation with the DSA DMA package. Uh, the idea behind it um, was that online platform need to be tackled at the, at the European level, not only at the national level. Um, as I said, obviously France, but also Germany and other, other member states in the European Union had um, uh, national legislation, some of which were effective or uh, were an n n nice tries to uh, try tackling, for example, accountability of uh, uh, such platform and putting uh, forward new regimes of uh, liability. Uh, other stakeholders um, had uh, the opinion that uh, if an actor is too big, he is too big to care. And then, obviously, um, there is a need to set international standards uh, for the digital economy. And for that, the main objective is to let's say, to propose clear rule and redefine responsibilities of digital services to address the risk faced by the users and take into account a uh, gatekeeping position, meaning big actors that as, act as gatekeepers on markets and new markets leveraged uh, by such platforms. So, uh, clearly, um, to tackle uh, you have IP infringement, but also there are reappearance of illegal content, or also, uh, as mentioned by colleagues, the privatization sometime of law enforcement. So th that's the aim of the of the pa of, of the packages, I'd say, and it's obviously being discussed as we speak. It's one of the uh, key discussion of the French presidency of the European Union, and as you may know. As uh, the French President Emmanuel Macron will uh, uh, set the scene of the French presidency later today. 
thank you very much. And um, our time is almost finished. Uh, that's why we need to summarize our discussion. Um, as we can see, uh, in most countries, uh, there are the process of adoption of laws concerning digital platforms. Uh, we speak about Europe, we speak about Africa, we speak about um, Grulak countries, and also if you look at the legislation of Australia, United Kingdom, India, China, and even United States, you will see that they are also trying to find the instruments to influence the digital platforms. And it's very interesting situation because uh, I think uh, in, in some time we'll see that there are almost the same rules in different countries for digital platforms. Because, uh, because of dialogue, any, each country look for legislation of another countries. Of course, we analyzed the European experience and, uh, um, for example, Australia and United Kingdom experience. And we have the best practice in our legislation. And the same country has the same process. That's why I think uh, in the future we'll have uh, the cumulative effect, which is almost the same as international treaty, but of course it uh, can't be um, instead of uh, international treaty. Uh, of course, the convention about uh, cybercrime is very important uh, and uh, we need to discuss it, but it's also, I think it's time to define some principle and main provisions uh, of uh, rights and obligations of digital platforms in international treaty itself. First of all, it's content moderation, taxation, uh, equitable access to data infrastructures and um, services. And um, another questions which are already defined in lots of laws or bills. Thank you very much uh, for discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who join us and um, of course I'd like to uh, thank our technical team for promoting this session and of course I'd like to thank our panelists to, who join us here and virtually thank you very much and I think this discussion will continue after the completion of our session and after the IJF itself because it's the main question of modern world, how to find a balance. Thank you very much, and you are dismissed. Thank you, Anna. Tremendous job. Thank you. Thank you, dear participants. Let's keep in touch.